Hi folks, welcome to another episode of the Repertory Channel. You know, it's uh, it's been a while since I made a video and talked to you guys. I uh, recently did a, a podcast with Slamfire Radio. I talked to them for about 30 minutes. There's a video up on their Facebook group and their YouTube channel. Talking about the infields and stuff like that. But uh, honestly, for my own channel, I haven't really done anything. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. One of which is because of uh, kind of our environmentals up here in northern Canada. <clears throat> is that uh, we've had forest fires all over the place. And that's called, it's had this kind of trickle down effect. I mean, first of all, the weather has been hot, hot and dry. And um, what that's done is it's, uh, we, we've had elevated levels of snowpack up in the mountains. Our entire spring was cool and dry. So there was no, there was very little in the way of snow melt. And then this hot, hot weather um, occurred and uh, all of the rivers went into flood because of snow melt, ice melt. And it's totally blown out the road to Rifle Chair Ranch. And so haven't been able to really even get there this year. And that's where my rifle range is, and uh, that's where I do all of, all of my testing, and and so that's had a material adverse effect on my channel because I haven't been able to do any rifle tests. And I made all these plans, and uh, haven't been able to uh, see them out. So that's uh, that's kind of crappy, but and the forest fires on top of that. I mean, it's kind of strange to have forest fires while you're in flood. Anyhow, so I guess I might as well just uh, cut firewood and um, get ready for winter. It's July and I'm thinking about winter already. <laughs> At least the wood is dry and it's not too hard here on this uh, this trailer. This, by the way, is one tank of fuel off the still MS391, which is a great saw. It's a 24-inch bar. And uh, this saw is... Uh, this is the new saw. Well, it's a year old now. And I love it. It really pulls you into the wood, though. I mean, you, you got to hang on to that saw. I mean, it pulls you right into the wood. And uh, and that 24-inch uh, um, bar really makes it easy, nicer, nicer to, to kind of reach in and, and and get to those hard, hard-to-reach pieces. But that's one tank of fuel. And I guess I'll head off and start splitting that here. And and the. Uh, the new Polaris Ranger, that, that is a force multiplier right there. Then I got the electronic um, wood, wood splitter in the back of it, and it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a force multiplier having one of these machines. I mean, having just a little buggy to, to operate around on the, uh, the homestead here, it's, it's uh, expanded my, um, my effectiveness by leaps and bounds. You know, it's a, it's only a 570 Polaris Ranger, but um, it's kind of the baseline model. But who cares? I mean, uh, it's got more than enough torque. I mean, maybe it doesn't have the top end speed that a lot of the 1,000 cc motors have. Um, but it's uh, just been a force multiplier. is the best way to for me to even think about it. And so this is the only way for us to get into rifle chair wrench now is on this buggy. But... Um, You know, but uh, we can't get there because uh, the water level, the, the road's under about 30 inches of water. And so that's kind of pretty close to where the air intakes are on this, um, on this uh, Ranger Polaris here. Polaris Ranger 570. So the air intakes are about, about 30 inches up off the ground. So I don't want to, I don't want to risk it. Don't want to bog down the machine in the middle of nowhere because that's basically where Rifle Tour Ranch is, is, uh, it's a remote wilderness location. Anyway, so all kinds of things have happened since I talked to you last. So I'm just kind of rambling on here. You know, I, I thought maybe I'd just give you guys a little bit of an update as to where I am, what's happening, and um, what I'm up to. But uh, since I really made, um, like, a proper rifle chair video, so much has happened. Uh, so much has happened, and almost all of it is bad. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, kind of um, geopolitically. 
First of all, not all of it is bad. I grew a beard, but the reason I grew a beard is because of bugs. We've had uh, with this um, with this heat wave, we've had a tremendous number of black flies and mosquitoes. In fact, I'm covered in mosquito bites and uh, black fly bites on my legs and my arms. You know, you just want to get out and enjoy the sun a little bit and and so on, but you're just getting hammered by bugs. <laughs> And man, the black flies this year are just brutal. Anyhow, so geopolitically, um, you know, with the residential schools and so on, um, it's really got me to thinking about what I thought I knew about Canada and, and our past. But uh, you know, I, I'm not a, a two-dimensional being. I, I can think. I can think in three dimensions. And um, here's what got what gets me though is that you know I've our family came to Canada and uh, it was around 1905. So in 1905, yeah, around there, from Scotland, and it's because we left you know my family left Scotland because they're essentially destitute. I mean it was so awful, you know, Britain, Scotland, um, just the the quality of life. Like these are people who are that they're acting out of desperation to get out of that hell hole and and come to the um they came to Canada and they they worked basically like slave labor migrated uh across Canada to the west and um just tried to carve out a living out of the wilderness and in many ways I mean um our family's still doing it you know just doing our best. You know, isn't that, we're not particularly just trying to survive like they were back then, but um, here's what gets me though, is, um, is that my entire life growing up, I had First Nations friends and good friends. And we never talked about this residential school business. Maybe they didn't even know about it, or maybe they did know about it, but it was never a topic. I mean, these are good buddies. I mean, we were going out fishing after school kind of buddies, you know? You talk about things that, that are on your mind or bothering you, and, and this subject never ever came up. Um, growing up through school, it was never part of the curriculum. We were never taught about the residential schools. It was a secret. It was kept secret. None of us knew about it. You know, it was strange. I mean, I... I never really understood um, reservations. All I knew is that after school, I would walk home and all the First Nation kids would get on the bus and they'd go back to the reservation. So, I mean, we didn't, I mean, outside of school, it was hard for us to, um, you know, to hang out. Because they they're geographically, you know, you know, separated from us. And I never liked that. I never liked that, but I kind of grew up just think, okay, well, this is just this is just the way it is. You know, you guys live down there, and well, I have to, I live over there, and I'll see you on Monday when we when we come back to school, kind of thing. Say, hey, high five, and see you later. But all the stuff that came, has been coming out, it's it's been a real eye opener for me because uh, just the secrecy that was behind that. So I've been I've been educating myself and. Um, Man, 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 it was bad what happened here in Canada. But it was our leaders that were doing this. It was the government, it was the church, it was our political, it was our politicians. They knew all about it. They knew all about it. And, uh, you know, the RCMP, they're, they're basically the enforcers of the, um, of the policy, the legislation, the regulation, the Indian Act. I mean, just the kind of things that uh, First Nations people had to go through just to get into, to come into town and, you know, do some food shopping. I mean, at one point in time, you had to have a permit just to come into town. That's kind of stuff. I mean, if you didn't have a permit, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're arrested and you were brought back to the reservation. You stay here. Meanwhile, they were coming into the um, reservations, physically removing their children, 
trucking them off to a residential school somewhere. I mean, can you imagine if somebody came to your house, physically took your children away at gunpoint? So all this stuff was kept from us. And yet here we are today, <clears throat> you're seeing the, the government, the liberal government, trying to push bills like Bill C-10, which is essentially a censorship bill. They want to be able to control what you hear and what you see. Using the CRTC as their body to, uh, to censor what you can hear and see. Your access to information. And here I am, growing up in, um, in Canada in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, totally censored from this, this incredibly important piece of our own history. And then I see them playing this stupid game again. And of course, it's the Liberals and it's the Bloc Québécois and the NDP that are, that are supporting us. Bill C-10, essentially a censorship bill. And it just kind of makes me think, we haven't changed. You know, Canadians are, are incredibly awesome people. First Nations people are incredibly awesome people. Our um, immigrants are incredibly awesome people. But our government sucks. Our federal government sucks. You know what? And in many ways... They're a weapon of mass destruction, is what they are. Well, that sounds over the top. Well, the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? You know, they, here's the one thing about the, the liberals. I know they keep they, Trudeau once he's got a minority government and he's just getting away with with literally murder because um, the Bloc Québécois and the NDP are supporting them. The only reason why their legislation is being passed through Parliament is because of the NDP and the uh, Bloc Québécois. You know, Canada needs a change, you guys. We need a we need a change. We can't keep voting for these um, these socialists and Marxists because um, the path forward. So what? Here's the thing: is what what they do? They get into power. And then they use the mechanisms of government to weaken their political adversaries. And their political adversaries are conservatives. And that's not right. When you're, when you're, when you're in government, you govern for all Canadians. All Canadians. That's not what they do. That is not what they do. They use the power and the mechanisms of government to weaken their political adversaries and those that support them, like gun owners. And they conflate things like crime control is the same thing as gun control. Well, they're totally separate issues. Gun control and crime control are not the same thing. They're big on gun control, soft on crime. In fact, bills, um, well, there's a number of bills, C-25, so Bill C-21, Bill, you know, this, I forget the numbers. But they're actually um, softening uh, the criminal justice system against people that have actually committed gun crimes. Bell C-25, as I recall. Well, at the same time, they're confiscating over 1,500 different types of firearms from, law from lawful Canadians that, that have absolutely nothing to do with any of those crimes. They're not the problem. Canada doesn't have a gun problem. It has a crime problem. But they're not addressing the, the root cause. I mean, we're talking about basic root cause analysis and causal factors for the reason why we have gun crimes in our inner cities. Blind to that. So what they do is they come on board and they say, we're going to do this, 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 this. What they end up doing is the opposite. Constantly, every single time you hear Justin Trudeau open his mouth, you can almost guarantee it. He's going to do the opposite of what he says. He makes it sound all beautiful and pretty, but in the end... It'll be a disaster. Anyway, in this climate of censorship, clamping down on um, lawful Canadians for no good reason, um, 
I have to be careful what I say. Welcome to the new Canada because, um, you know, I'm just going through the process of renewing my federal firearms license. And so I have to think about what it is that I say because now they're going to be giving me, you know, background checks from when I, you know, if I did, if I did anything wrong when I was 16 years old, it may have an impact on my ability to, to obtain a, a firearms license. You know, I've, I've kept my nose clean my whole life. I've been a member of the law enforcement community. I served 18 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, I've been a taxpayer for all my life. I've been working since I was 16 years old. I kept my nose clean the whole time. But if I say one thing, somebody could construe uh, poorly on the internet or through social media, they could con conceivably deny my application to renew it. It's, uh, it's not good. And so, I mean, uh, the kind of general tone of this video is not positive, is it? Trust me, I would rather be out testing rifles right now. Different loads, different ammunition types that I've tailored for my, uh, for my rifles. I've got some interesting projects I really want to show you. This is not physically possible for me to do it right now, so I might as well use my time wisely and and uh, this morning, before the sun came out, I started chopping this wood. I'm covered in sweat, covered in sawdust. Got my new bucking pants out. And uh, getting some work done, as you do. But the political environment in Canada is... I've never seen it like this before. Okay, so, you know, people are out burning down churches and, and so on. There's been, what, half a dozen, maybe six, seven, eight churches that have been burnt down. Um, people are making assumptions that it's the First Nations community doing it. I'm not convinced of that. I mean, we saw this in the uh, in 2020, as the anti-Trump crowds were um, burning down their inner, inner cities. What they were doing was the Black Lives Matters and so on. Is that uh, you know what? When I was watching the news, they were all white people doing this stuff. Not all of them, but I mean. Is Antifa business? Well, it's taken root here, isn't it? So I'm not convinced who it is that that is burning down these churches. But here's the thing: these are for, these are churches that are that are on First Nations land. A lot of them, and the people that are being hurt by this, it's the First Nations people. That makes me mad. And essentially, what's what's going on is a hate crime. I mean, two wrongs don't make a right. Everybody knows that. But they lack the moral fiber and character to know the difference. So that's what's going on. You know, it really, really impacts your belief in Canadians. But here's the thing, is that it's a tiny minority of very loud and, frankly, very evil people doing this. And so, you know, you can, you can make some... What I don't like to do is called identity politics and say that you, because you have a particular style or skin color or belief that you represent everybody that looks like you, that is ultimately called racism. And uh, group identity politics is very dangerous and is a hallmark of communism and Marxists. And if we don't get a gra grasp on that, man, Canada's in real trouble. Anyway, the oh, situation just sucks. Maybe next time when um, I make a rifle chair video, hopefully I'll have some good news for you. Right now it's uh, it's not great, but we are, you know, we've uh, we've got our way through the COVID nineteen situation. All of us are relatively healthy. You know, it's stressful right now. But we're making do. And, uh, well, prepping as usual, getting ready for winter, even though it's the height of summer. I don't know if I'll post this video or not, but i got to post something. I mean, I haven't put a video on my channel for quite a while. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're all doing great. Cheers, and as always, Maple Leaf up.